Our scripture reading comes from Micah, one of the minor prophets, chapter 7, verse 7. And I'm sure there's someone out there thinking, like, how is he going to Micah 7 for our Christmas message? Guess you'll just have to wait and see, huh? But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. The word of the Lord. You know, Christmas is filled with wonderful sounds, isn't it? The sounds of laughter and the sounds of celebration. The sounds of music. I mean, I think back over my college years and there was nothing more heart-moving than to be in Heinz Hall in Pittsburgh with the Mendelssohn Choir and the Pittsburgh Chamber Orchestra listening to the whole Messiah. I mean, the whole Messiah. I mean, because everybody thinks, well, we hear the Messiah and you hear the Alleluia Chorus and then you're willing to walk out, that's the end of this. No, no, that's not the end. Because the Handel's Messiah goes on to talk about why it's so important that the Savior's come into the world to go to the cross and what he did on the cross. So it continues for almost another 45 minutes. Boy, was that shocking the first time I was there and they did that because I was used to do, us doing the Christmas one at church. But you know, it's exciting to hear those music, to hear that music and to hear those sounds in our ears. There's nothing like hearing kids giggle and when they open up presents and they squeal with delight that they got something they wanted. Or the groans we got when we opened up underwear and socks for Christmas. And, and, you know, the parents were just smiling from ear to ear. Got them. Because they always came before the stuff you really wanted. Did you ever know how conspiratorial parents are? You notice that? But the sounds of music really seem to refresh my soul and refresh a lot of people's souls. What would it be like not to hear the music of Christmas? It's uplifting. And I started to think about that. What would it be like not to hear those sounds? And my mind wandered to my son, Matthew, who in his mid-30s has significant hearing loss from his time in the service. And um, what would it be like not to hear these wonderful words from Scripture, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. What would it be like not to hear them echoed through this season of the year? Well, then my mind wandered, as it often does, from Christmas sounds to the times I wondered, does God hear my prayers? Down through the years, I've wondered, as I'm praying oftentimes, God, are you listening to me? Uh, I wonder sometimes he's saying, oh, that's worth again. He's repeating himself for the 15th zillionth time. You ever wonder if he thinks that way and wants to just tune you out? Because we all understand how it is when people tune us out, right? When we talk about God hearing... The Hebrew and Greek words mean that they actually comprehend what you're saying. And we know those of us who are married, those of us who have been parents or, or school teachers or whatever it is, that sometimes people around us, especially children, do not listen. And then sometimes our older parents, who we get to the age where we're caring for, do not really comprehend what we're saying and they're not listening. So we understand the dynamic there, right? So do you ever wonder, is God hearing me? Have you ever asked the question, why aren't you listening to me, God? Are you really going to ever answer my prayers? I mean, I prayed for years for Rebecca's physical healing, trusting that God could heal her. And his decision was to heal her by taking her home to glory. I prayed for Sue over the years. Uh, for our marriage, for our life together, for raising kids together, that's always a challenge. You know, you have two willful people together in the same house. It's, you know, can be tough at times, especially when you're both firstborns and both stubborn as rocks. But then it's, after a heart attack, I kept praying and wondering, God, are you listening? What's changing? Because it doesn't seem like anything's changing. And then I prayed for others and with others for things in the world and wonder. God, aren't you listening? Because things don't seem to be changing. And then I pray my 8 to 15 list. Remember the 8 to 15 list that we ask, we ask you to pray that God would reveal himself through the Holy Spirit to people around you, in your family unit, in your neighborhood. 
and you look at their lives and you go, especially in my family, God, I pray that almost every day. How come it doesn't seem to be changing? And then I pray for our country's leaders just as God asks. And I, want, I wonder, God, are you hearing my prayers? Because our world is still messed up. Crime is rising. Disunity abounds. People hate people. Strife is everywhere. And it's even penetrated into the church. And in the church, God's people are more disunited than united. And I wonder where that unity is that Jesus prayed in that great priestly prayer, John 17, where he says, Father, I pray that they may be one like you and I are one. Have you been there? Have you had those thoughts? Do you wonder if God is ever listening to you? Does God hear you? Well, this a couple months ago, as I was thinking about that, I stumbled across these words from Micah. And I hope they give us hope today. Because Micah says, my God will hear me. And I think what you need to know is you need to understand the context. Because, you know, we say, oh, that's just the prophet Micah. He was a man of God. He was a holy one. Of course God listens to people like him and pastors. I don't know about that sometimes. But you have to understand that the world of Micah's day was completely messed up. Completely messed up. Listen to what he writes. The godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. Ooh. They all lie in wait for blood and hunt each other with a net. Their hands are on what is evil to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe. Think about that. The judge is asking for a bribe. He's supposed to be milling out justice. He's supposed to represent good, right? And lawless and lawfulness. And yet he's acting lawlessly. And the great man utters the evil desire of his soul, thus they weave it together. And the best of them is like a briar, and the most upright of them a thorn hedge. This is not a good place. Government officials are corrupt. Your neighbors are just as corrupt as the government officials and evil, Micah says. You can't trust anyone. Neighbor no longer could trust neighbor. Friends couldn't trust one another. And the family unit was completely dissolving. As he goes on to say, put no trust in the neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Listen to this. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. Your your spouse. That person you're supposed to be able to confide in and trust in. And Micah says... They're going to gossip about you. So you have to guard what you say, even to the one who you're supposed to love unconditionally, that you should be able to share anything with and trust that they'll keep the confidence. For the son treats the father with contempt, and the daughter raises up against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. The fifth commandment lay in ruins in Micah's day. The fifth commandment is the first of the Ten Commandments that goes to the horizontal, that is the relationship among people. The first three talk about God. Well, actually, the first four. The fourth being the Sabbath day to keep it holy still talks about how we worship and honor God. So the first four are vertical. The rest of them now are what? Horizontal. And they talk about how you and I interact with people. And the first one that God addresses is honor your father and mother that days may be long in the land which God, the Lord your God has given you. And yet it's laying in disrepair. It's ruined. His parents were no longer being honored. Grandparents were no longer being honored. And sons and daughters-in-laws were attacking their in-laws. And people were betraying one another. No one was keeping secrets. Gossip was everywhere. There was a complete breakdown in society as people no longer respected one another. And the family loyalty, the family unit was becoming null and void. It was becoming a lost concept. Culture had moved far, far away from that cornerstone of society, the family, and what it means when you have a mother and a father and kids living together and operating together in a godly manner. They had left it all behind. So their communities were now in disrepair and decaying, and disunity prevailed. In the midst of this societal breakdown, Micah starts to declare hope. And he starts with this word. He says, as for me, 
Micah says, I'm going to change my attitude. I'm going to look at the world around. Instead of seeing all the problems, I've decided that, yeah, the problems are around here. I see them. I'm not ignorant of them. I'm aware of them. But I'm going to look to God. I'm going to forget about the lawlessness of my society. I'm going to look to God. And by the way, that's a decision that you and I should be making in this culture today because our world is full of all sorts of bad things happening. Philosophical ideas that go against the creation that try to mar the image of God in man. And too often what you and I do is we focus on all that's going on around us and the wrongness of what's going on around us and we whine, lament, and complain instead of just turning our eyes to look at God. Micah says, as for me. By the way, this isn't the first time we've heard this phrase in the Bible. Joshua was challenging the people. His, his rulership over Israel was about to end. They had come into the promised land. They were settling in. And he looks at them and he says, you guys have a choice to make. Are you going to serve the gods of the culture? Are you going to serve the ideas and philosophies of the culture around you? Are you going to serve the gods that our forefathers worshipped in Egypt when we were in slavery? Or are you going to worship the Lord your God who has delivered you from slavery? He broke you out of captivity changed your life, given you this land flowing with milk and honey? Are you going to follow the God who performs signs and wonders to demonstrate his power, to get your attention, to move in your life? Who will you serve? And Joshua says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the choice that we have to make just like Joshua and Micah had to make it. So what are you going to do? Are you going to look at culture? Are you going to look at the prevailing philosophies of the day? Or are you going to look back to God? Because Micah says, as for me, I will look to the Lord. My focus, my attention will not be on all the things going wrong around me and the depression it brings and the hopelessness, hopelessness it causes. I'm going to look at God. My focus is going to be on God. We hear that once again in another place in Scripture. In a confusing time where a group of Christians were under persecution and they were deciding whether it was better to go back and leave the faith or to stay in the faith, the writer of Hebrews says this, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Put your eyes on Jesus. You see, everything in the world was going bad for Jesus. The king of glory was going to die and suffer in the process. But he looked forward to what it would be like to be with you in God's presence and the joy that is accompanying that with you in his presence. And he continued to endure and he looked to the God who could deliver them. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, as we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Micah is saying, turn your eyes and look to the Lord. Keep your focus on Jesus. Because Micah says, I will stay in conversation with God. I will keep on praying. And I will wait. Oops. There's that four-letter word that none of us like for the most part, right? Anybody like waiting for anything? Now, we're an instantaneous society, right? You know where all the computer innovation is coming from? Is because people don't like to wake nanoseconds. You know, 20 nanoseconds is just too slow for my computer to boot up, so I want a processor in my computer that can do it in 18. 15 would be better. You can barely take a breath in that time. You can't even take a breath in that time. We love instant food. We love quick cooking food. We don't like to wait. But Micah says, I will wait on the Lord. I wonder sometimes if the reason why we don't understand that God does hear us is because we're not waiting on the Lord. See, I prayed my prayer. I want an immediate action, God. But 
But the Bible says, wait on the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Notice that. While you're waiting for the Lord, your heart can get stronger. Your faith can get deeper. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. Oh, now when you're waiting for, for God, what? You turn to his word. And all of a sudden, you find out that his word through scripture is giving you hope. And Isaiah says, therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. Therefore, he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. Who wait for him. We wait for God's salvation. We wait for God to move and extend mercy and grace. We wait for God to overthrow governments. We wait for God to overthrow tyrants. We wait for God. We wait for God to speak to us. But here's the problem I think we have, or at least I have. See, when I think of waiting, I think of someone passively sitting in a chair, just waiting, twiddling their thumbs, or playing solitaire, or playing some mindless game on the computer. And in the process, they're just waiting for something to happen. But the reality is the Hebrew words here for wait and look are active. God is calling you to be an active participate in the process of waiting because waiting requires you and I to keep on praying and be persistent in prayer. And that's why Jesus told that parable of a woman who was driving the judge up a tree. Until she got justice, she would not leave that guy alone. And he says, she's wearing me out. I can't take it anymore. I'm going to make sure she has justice. And Luke tells us the editorial comment. The Lord taught this parable so that the disciples would know they needed to be persistent in prayer. <laughs> Waiting is active. We're in his word. We're praying for God to move. You and I are participants in that. So we're waiting on God to act. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer me. I love David's confidence. He says without a doubt, God will answer. He has no doubt that God's going to answer. He has confidence that God will answer. And that's the same thing with Micah. Micah's confidence is strong. He declares, God will hear me. I will look to God, I will wait, and he will hear me. He's trusting in God. He believes that God has the answers to all the society has going wrong. So he waits for God to move salvifically. Micah understands that only God can turn around the situation, that only God has the solution. Micah has confidence that God will help him because in verse 8 he says, I will fall down, but then I will rise. Basically, nobody's going to keep me down because God is walking with me. He says, I may sit in darkness, but the Lord will be a light to me. And that made me think of Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? And isn't that our hope at Christmas? Because the world is a dark place. And Jesus is absolutely correct when he says in John 3 that people would rather walk in darkness because they love the darkness, because light would expose their deeds, and they prefer to stay in the darkness. They don't want to deal with their sin and their guilt. But the light of the world is who we celebrate, and we remember, we remember, <laughs> We are reminded, we are reminded at Christmas that the light of the world has come into the world. And John declares that darkness has not overcome it. Darkness may be all around us, but the light remains undefeated. And darkness never wins. Even when it appears to be winning, our hope is, and the settled word of God is, that it has not won. For Micah, it's a settled matter. God will hear him. It's only a matter of time. God will hear his prayer. Micah and Isaiah, by the way, were living in an era where the king was terrible, ungodly, and people were crying out to God for help. 
And they prophesied about a coming Messiah 700 years before Jesus showed up into history. I don't think God has asked any of us to wait 700 years. But for Micah, he goes on here in that chapter of 7 to outline the mercies of God and the compassion of God that will come. And he says that God's enemies will be dealt with rightly and justly. And he is confident that God's salvation will come. Micah had already given us that great prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrata, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming is from of old, from ancient of days. Micah here says that this Messiah that's coming out of Bethlehem will be a great shepherd, and he will lead people in God's strength, not in his own strength and not in his own power, but in the strength of the living God. And he will be great and mighty, and he will be their peace. You know, one of the things that our world is always looking for is a place of contentment, a place of peace. And they look for it in all these places. And they don't want to hear what you and I have to say about God because they think we're narrow-minded, closed-minded, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is the one thing they're looking for deep inside of them is a place of peace and contentment where they're at rest. And the only one who can give that to him is Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. Salvation is coming. That's exactly what Micah says. The Messiah is coming. And as I reflect on that, I wondered, so where does that confidence come from? Because how many of you can say that here on Sunday morning, but Monday through Saturday, it's a little tough? You see, I think for Micah... This confidence flows out of his deep relationship with God. His words are not just wishful thinking or some pie in the sky, Pollyanna, oh yeah, everything will be good. I, I love Scarlett O'Hara's line from Gone with the Wind. Well, tomorrow's another day. I'll deal with it tomorrow. No, Micah has this abiding relationship with God. And that because he has that abiding relationship with God, he understands that he can trust God. He understands he needs to be dependent on God. And he understands that when he is trusting God and dependent upon God, he has an assurance of his future that is like no other. And that's the assurance that God promises us. He says, my God will hear me. And I thought about that and I wondered and I realized that Christmas actually confirms that. Think about that. Christmas confirms that because salvation is part of God's great plan. Make no mistake about it. The Bible declares that over and over again. That God had a plan after his people sinned. He knew he would have to redeem them, and he had a plan in place. But you know what Christmas also reminds us of is that people were crying for help, people who were broken and hurting and lost and wanting answers, who didn't have that peace and contentment, who were struggling with all that life has to deal with them and all the BS that life throws at them, and they were crying out for help, and God sent them a Messiah. God sent him a savior. God sent him one who would break them free from the bondage that was enslaving them. Whatever it was, whether it be their pride or whether it be an addiction, whether it be their education, whatever it was, he would set them free. And that caused me to remember very quickly that God does hear prayers because he heard the Israelites. There they are in slavery. And he says to Moses, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them out of that land to a, to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. I have seen the oppression with which, with which the Egyptians have oppressed them. God heard his people. And he moved. God heard Manasseh's prayer. We talked about that last week, right? And he delivered him from the bondage of the Assyrians in prison to restoring him to his throne. God heard the prayer of Jonah in the belly of a whale. <laughs> he heard Daniel. He heard Daniel's prayer, and he honored Daniel's prayer. And then when Daniel was thrown in jail because 
Daniel prayed with his windows wide open despite the decree that the king had set, right? The Bible says that the angel of the Lord, we believe the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is the pre-incarnated Christ, shows up and has a little conversation with Daniel and spends the night with him there in that de- lion's den while all the lions are laying peacefully watching their creator. Think about that. They had reverent awe for their creator and laid there. What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who refused to worship the idol, got thrown into the fiery furnace, and the king says, I thought we'd throw three, three in, and there's four, because the angel of the Lord showed up to them. What about David? Because God heard his prayers for forgiveness for the sins that he did. And Elijah, from the depths of his depression, he had this glorious victory. And then as he's running from the threats of Jezebel, he goes into this deep depression and whines and complains to God. And God heard his prayers in that place. God heard the prayers of Elisha and Elijah on two different occasions when they walked into the rooms of children, of widows who were dead, and raised their sons back to life. Elijah heard the prayer, the Bible says, of Elijah when he prayed for drought to prove God's point to the people and the kings who were disobeying. And then three and a half years later, he prayed for the drought to end, and it ended. God heard his prayers. And then there were the people in Isaiah and Micah's day who were praying for deliverance. And God gave them this sign. And these are the wonderful words we celebrate at Christmas. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. For the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. What powerful words we celebrate at Christmas. It's a response to the prayers of people looking for salvation who needed hope. And the cool thing is today that Savior has come and he's available to you today. And he's there to deliver your life from whatever is inflicting it, whatever struggle you have. Because just because you accepted Christ doesn't mean you don't have have struggles in your life. And you still don't need deliverance from something. Because the world's still going to beat on you. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, the world's going to beat on you even more. Because Satan, what? He's looking to embarrass God. And if he can do it through making you an embarrassment for God, he'll cheerfully jump into the pond to do it. But guess what? The God in you is far greater. And the God in you can help you overcome it. That's salvation. That's what Christmas is about. That God hears the prayers of his people in their times of need, in their times of questioning, and responds. God does hear the prayer of his people. The psalmist put it this way, I cried to him with my mouth, and the high praise was on my tongue. And if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has listened, truly has, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. I was reading those words, and all of a sudden it dawned on me, and I remembered how God has answered my prayer over the years. Despite my laments sometimes, that God, are you listening? I realized that his steadfast love has never left me. It's always been present. From the death of my grandfather, Wilson, which opened doors of opportunity for my life to take me from what was a bad place in a family situation and a family dynamic to the safe haven of living with my aunt Ethel. It shows God's steadfast love. God showed me down through the years how he's heard my prayers and my cries and my confessions, and he has always met me with his steadfast love and his mercy and his grace. He showed me how and reminded me how he took Sue and I and our whole family from one place to another place, eventually bringing us out here where we settled down and all of a sudden our family prospered here and our, my children blossomed here. 
And even in Becca and Sue's death, God has heard my prayers. And he has answered them. He's answered them in unexplainable ways. But through it all, the biggest answer to my prayer was his presence and his care for me never left. Now I'm reminded this Christmas that God hears the prayers of his people, those who are crying out for help, those who are hurting and broken. Yes, those who are even desperate for something to change. Those whose circumstances and situations have put them in a dilemma that they don't understand. Those who are seeking direction or answers to God or answers from God. He hears those prayers and he will move because that's exactly what he did in Jesus. Because Jesus came in the, into this world to be Emmanuel, meaning God with us. I am reminded that God is with us because Jesus came into the world at Christmas time and because he lived his life and died for us and rose again, he lives with us every day and his presence is always here with us. So therefore, God may not have answered our salvation the way we wanted him to, but he's answered it in a far better way because instead of just getting an answer to a prayer, we have the living presence of God when we believe in him living within us accompanying us every day, helping us come over everything. No matter how big the obstacles are, no matter how big the looming threat of something is, our God is bigger still. And that God came into this world so he could be God with you and me. I'm reminded that God is here every day, that he does hear my prayer, that he doesn't leave us or forget us. He doesn't walk away from us. He is the God who hears us, stays with us, who saves us. That's what we celebrate this Christmas. The God who hears the prayers of his people, enters into the relationship with them, and accompanies them through all that life can throw at them. And that's the joy of Christmas for me. That God has heard your prayers and my prayers, that he's filling us with his presence. And his steadfast love is always there with us. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into the world that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have life everlasting in his presence. May the joy of Christmas and his presence in you give you that peace that you long for. Keep seeking him and you will find that peace peace of Christmas, the peace of a Savior. Father God, I just thank you for these words. Lord, I just ask that you'd be with us, that you'd help us to find that peace in you. Lord, you are our God. You are mighty to save us. And so, Lord, we just ask right now that you'd speak, that those of us who may be struggling, that you hear our prayers, <clears throat> and that you would answer them. Thank you for being the God who lives with us. In the name of Christ, amen.